All right, let me bring in Bart. Bart, if you had the choice, oh boy, uh, of being Carlo Ancelotti, manager Real Madrid, or Carlo Ancelotti, manager of Brazil, which would you pick? <laughs> Ooh, well, right now I would pick Real Madrid. This is a no contest for me right now. And Carlo Ancelotti basically says, yeah, I, I listened to him and that's it. I just, I, they put it out on the table for me and yeah, whatever. Exactly. Whatever. So he basically just had, he used it. He's just like, yep, it's all good. Nope. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving Real Madrid. I'll listen to Brazil, but Brazil is a train wreck right now. Yeah. Well, and part of the reason Brazil is a train wreck right now is, you know, they are without a real coach. <laughs> so that doesn't help. So that's a little bit on Ancelotti. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, right now they are struggling, to say the least. Struggling. Yes, they are. Yes, they are absolutely. They are struggling to say the, the very least here. Uh, so since last time you were on, what have we missed when it comes to, well, obviously, I think later in the week we've got some some names that are going to be on a list here, but. What have we missed when it comes to, to refing down here and national team stuff that you that you wanted to get on the table here as uh, Mondays on a Tuesday? Uh, well, um, I think the most important thing is, as you mentioned, we have the Camp Cupcake roster dropping on Friday. Uh -huh. um, I am curious. I'm hopeful, I should say, that the roster is very youngster based. Mm -hmm. Um we do know that, you know, the U23s have been given a lot of priority recently. That's one of the benefits of having Matt Crocker now in charge as he is kind of focusing on all the things. Um, I hope, I hope that um, a certain Atlanta United homegrown is on that roster on Friday. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know who I'm talking about, that's kidding. <laughs> I've, heard of, I've heard I've heard it. <laughs> Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if he is because, you know, we saw him make an appearance for the senior national team um, last year in El Cachico. Mm -hmm. And he has featured a lot for the U-20s as well. Obviously, going into the this year for the U-23 squad, yeah. he, in my opinion, is still one of the best left backs we have in the pool, senior or youngster, you know. and this is a huge opportunity, and I really hope that he's on the roster. I don't know if he is or isn't. I can't. I haven't done that reporting, but um, I think that Atlanta United fans need to, as I've said in a long time, we need to start understanding that Caleb Wiley is a very special talent um, in a position of need, and he has a real chance here. and And I really hope that he is on that roster to prove that he deserves to be not just an Olympic team member, but also part of the senior squad. Uh, going forward, how much of this, when it comes to to naming names on rosters, is still political and, and still you know, instead of just putting folks out there and trying to approach things logically, whether you're talking about a camp cupcake situation where you should be kicking the tires on some folks as opposed to just throwing the same names out there over and over again, how much of this is still tied to the quote unquote network? And, hey, you know, we, we need to give these guys some run. We need to continue to give these guys run and not look at other folks. How much of this is still tied to uh, illogical decision-making? Well, I don't think any anymore for a couple of reasons. One, the sum partnership between MLS and U.S. soccer no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, that has been dissolved. And also, um, I think U.S. soccer is probably a little upset with MLS right now <laughs> um, with the way that they've, um, treated some of their initiatives and competitions recently. So I don't expect at all any um, any sort of preference. Um, that said, this yeah. will be an MLS heavy camp yeah. because you know obviously the leagues that um, are playing right now are where our you know, our best players are playing in important leagues, um, and they're not playing right now. The the only you know caveat would be there are a couple of leagues that are obviously in a winter break. But I doubt that they're going to allow um, an important player to come onto the, this 
particular camp roster. How many? How, then let me ask you this: for a camp, Joe Scali and Gio Reyna aren't on this roster. Let's just make sure. Let's just unequivocally say that. <laughs> well, and because the reason I was going to ask, how many folks do you? How many surprises? I guess uh, would you? Uh, be sitting there and saying, okay, this would be a surprise, this would be a surprise, and this would be a surprise. Are you expecting this roster at Camp Cupcake to be, yeah, okay, I figured it was going to lay out this way, or are you anticipating that some folks might have some aces up their sleeve here? I, I, I genuinely don't know, John, because, um, you know, Greg has in the past been – a little mix on what this camp cupcake is. He's used it to get MLS guys who he view, who he values highly um, a chance to play, but he's also you know used this as a chance to get young players um, into camp. We've seen them kind of host dual U23 and senior national team camps before. So I I don't know if I have an answer to that question, John, because I don't know. We haven't been told how this camp will be treated. Um, Again, we know that there are U23 camps that have been slated, so I don't think it'll necessarily be that type of a camp. But I do hope that we're prioritizing young MLS talent as opposed to bringing Walker Zimmerman back in for another time. And no slight to Walker, but it's just like, buddy, we like he's not the future of the national team. We've got a Copa America coming up in, what, six months? Yeah. Six and a half. And... You know, do we need to see Aaron Long again? No, I don't need to see Aaron Long play soccer ever again, let alone for the U.S. <laughs> national team. You know, I don't need a Sean Johnson in camp. You know, so it, it, there are, you know, you, we do need to start having these standards and, and expecting U.S. soccer and, and the men's national team coaches to treat this with less, I, I hate to say severity, but treat this for what it should be. And it's a way to get younger talent exposed so that they can either see them in person and truly evaluate them or, you know, just give them a shot as it is. All right. So then you're the general manager for this particular window. Who would you like to see on this roster come the announcement after, of course, the show is over on Friday? Uh, yeah. So I would like to see, I, I mentioned Caleb Wiley. He's one. Um, you know, Jalen Neal, again, come back from the Galaxy. Um, you know, I'm sure Aiden Morris should be a guy that we see. Um, but there are there are some others that, um, you know, maybe I don't want to see is a better question. Like Dewan Jones, do you want to see him or not? Um, he's an experienced MLS veteran. He's been in a lot of camps. But, you know, do I need to have another camp where I see Dewan Jones? He hasn't truly made a mark at the senior national team. And we found a guy at left back and Christopher Lund, who seems to have replaced him in the pecking order. So do we need to see him again? I don't know. Um, same with a guy like Brooks Lennon. Do we need to see Brooks Lennon? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I will always defend Brooks Lennon as an Atlanta United player, mm -hmm. but is he the type of player that we need to see in this camp? So, but there are, there are younger players, um, you know, the, the Philadelphia cohort of Quinn Sullivan and company, <laughs> um, Jack McGlynn, you know, those are guys I would like to see in this type of a camp where get them involved. Um, Roman Celentano, uh, Schulte, and even to an extent, uh, Calendar from Miami. Um, those are players who I think would be worthwhile. And a shout maybe from an Atlanta United side of things. Maybe you get Josh Cohen in there. I know he's a little bit older, but we haven't really seen him in camp outside of like one European window. So maybe a Josh Cohen is a guy that you bring in as a goalkeeper to say, okay, where do you, where do we see you in our depth chart as a goalkeeper? Yeah, so I wanted you to put your thinking cap on this morning a little bit. Um, when it comes, Brandon to Vasquez and Miles, hold on, Brandon Vasquez and Miles Robinson are two that I do think are interesting, right? Yeah, um, I think we all expect Miles to. Well, I shouldn't say expect. We all hope that he goes to a European team. I think Vasquez is another one who wants to go to a European team. Curious to see how they end up coming into this camp, right? Because what if they're getting calls? <laughs> what, if, what if PSV is truly on the phone? What if uh, Frankfurt is truly on the phone um, for either of those guys? Are they coming into camp to risk that, you know? Yeah. And if yeah. they're not, if they're not getting those calls, maybe camp is what they need. Maybe they need to have a good showing against Slovenia 
and and you know maybe a, a Vasquez hat trick against Slovenia is what he needs <laughs> to get the attention of some of the you know callers from Europe. Uh, sidebar: uh, Philip Poole is now going to be the new head coach at the uh, USL Super League Carolina franchise. That was just announced here in the last handful of minutes. So. Uh, for them. He is going to stick with the team through she believes, and then he's going to take over USL yeah. Carolina. So that came out the top. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's what that's a good hire, I suppose, if you're going to try to find someone who has the experience within the system you want. Uh, okay, so article from our friends at the Independent, Carl Matchett, uh, yesterday a- after festive fixtures uh, finally came to a close. And Arsenal hit their brick wall. Sorry, Bart. Uh, Wolves manager Gary O'Neill proclaimed, quote, what is the point in VAR, end quote. His side felt aggrieved after yet more decisions proved vital in defeat at Fulham. Newcastle boss Eddie Howe labeled a penalty against his own club in stoppage time against PSG, a poor decision which looks completely different in a slowed-down replay to officials watching on monitors. The current situations come after an increase in the use of technology in football over the past few years, but none seems to create as much heated debate and questioning as that of VAR. By and large, it is felt that minor and visible calls are improved across the course of the season, with on-pitch referees getting extra help. However, there have been several high-profile incidents of late that have led to clubs or personnel within them complaining about the eventual decision or decision-making process and once again getting into the Champions League about this. When you still have managers, Anj Postacoglu being one, Gary O'Neill apparently being another, not getting the point of VAR, when, when you look at how VAR is being implemented right now in the Premier League from your viewing yeah. this season, how would you how would you view VAR in the Prem versus what we see here in the United States? Well, you know, this all goes back to uh, decisions that fully started on January 31st, 2020, and that's Brexit. This is what happens when, uh, you know, Europe and the UK split, and now you have the UK doing all what they want to do. I'm joking. But <laughs> the, the problem is I think that they are – the the agree – the aggrieved parties have some sort of point where you are looking at, because they obviously know better than every other human on the planet, John, every other, you know, soccer body doesn't do it as well as the Premier League and the FA. Um, (laughs) We know this and, you know, they feel that they are going to do it slightly differently than what UEFA does. And some of the more continental, leagues do. And I, I, I think that is a valid criticism of VAR being used in the Premier League. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, I think that we do need to see, I mean, look, no ball has ever gone out of play against Arsenal this season, apparently. So I understand this. Um, and, and there are legitimate gripes with that, that I think other coaches share of, we have the technology to make these a little bit less human and more automated slash technologically driven. And and I think those are some things that would greatly help VAR. But I agree that there are some decisions um, that have quite honestly been flubbed. Um, And and I think probably, probably one of the bigger things that I think at least I as a viewer have a problem with is the length of time it takes to decide yes. if something is clear and obvious. Yes. And and I think that's something that, again, despite what people say about pro, MLS does get correct, is I think our VAR system is a little bit better than others. And, and when we see VAR have a problem, like when we see a length of time with VAR here in the U.S. and MLS especially, it tends to be because a referee has gone to a monitor, you know? And, and that's where I think in the Premier League, honestly, bothers me the most is someone else is making the decision for the, offici- the on-field officiating crew. And I would rather see than say, hey, man, you should take a look at this. And sen- I, I don't see as many referees in the Premier League go to a monitor to make a decision. Um, instead, you have people in a room trying to find every single angle to disprove the referee before making any sort of decision. 
it sounds like it sounds like a lot of times, at least when you observe, they're working, they're trying to work from a negative and come forward using too much. Absolutely. To try and find something. Yes, I, I, I do think that's something that's a problem. Now, granted, you know, yesterday there was an absolutely shocking, embarrassing, pathetic display of terrible sportsmanship by you know Liverpool to get a pen, to penalty kick after he clearly lost control of the ball due to, a, due to a bad touch around the goalkeeper and decided that, oh, well, the goalkeeper maybe sneezed on me a little bit, so I'll fall down three steps after I've gone by. Are we sure, and that was, are we sure it wasn't Richie Larea who did that? <laughs> good Lord. It was such, John, that was such a bad flop. <laughs> such a bad flop. And, but he saved because technically, yes, there was contact. Well, then, then that goes to the laws of the game. And so it's once again, you have the, yeah. the laws that are in front of you and trying to determine what's going on there. Uh, Abby mentioned that it all goes back to the quality of refing as a whole. And my question for you is New Year's resolution. When it comes to you as an official, what resolutions do you have about yourself in that part of your CV? What, what, what are you looking to become or what are you looking to improve upon next year yourself when it comes to, to having the, the whistle and the cards and the jersey out there? Yeah, as I tweeted yesterday, one of my big resolutions legitimately is I need to get more yellow cards for obvious time wasting and delay tactics. Um, and this includes a lot of times the I'm going to just run up and stand in front of the ball. Um, you know, as Joey, um, Joey Logan, who I retweeted, said, you know, you don't have to ask for 10 as an attacker, we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. The defenders need to start respecting that more. And this whole BS of I'm going to just stand in front of the ball or I'm going to run up to in front of the ball after something's already happened. That uh, personally, that's something that I, I want to stop because it, it does one of two things. Uh, it either a delays the game, which we just don't want to have or B causes a potentially hazardous situation, which we also don't want to have. No. Yeah, that, uh, that how many how many of the official do you have regular conversations with the other officials in, in your in your officiating circle? Do you guys kind of you know, away from the field? Do you guys have regular conversations about what you're learning, what you're doing, what you're what happened? You know, do you guys have debriefs on your own? Uh, we have not not outside of the field right yeah. so if we're at the field we'll have conversations um and those will go on well after games and then i have a couple of referee friends who i personally have conversations with just because we're interested um but it's not we we don't have that because uh, you know i'm not going to in a chat group and text these people, but there are some Facebook groups I'm a part of. No, but I mean, like, if you're just sitting around, it's like, yeah, we're gonna, you're getting a couple of beers, and it just happens to be like your buddies. Yeah, they're out there. Do you have those kind of? Does it drift into that kind of a casual? Uh, yeah, we we there's a couple that I have that conversation with. Yeah, and we and we discuss how you know obviously we're right and everyone else is wrong. <laughs> that's how that's the official mindset, right? Absolutely, it, that is absolutely how this goes. Uh, how do you keep yourself? from turning into a blackjack dealer, even though I know that's not your, that's not your MO. How do you keep yourself from turning into a blackjack dealer in a situation like, you know, where you, you know, you probably should be giving cards and giving cards and giving cards, but you know, you, you have that balance of trying not to uh, drag the game down and yeah. take it someplace it doesn't want to go knowing that at the same time, I probably need to be given cards a little better or faster than I have been. Yeah, I think, again, for me, what I'm trying to give cards for are procedural issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to, for me, those are justified. Yeah. I don't like to give cards for fouls or, you know, stuff like that because that is very subjective. Um, you know, there are, again, there are times that those are required, you know, stopping a promising attack super dangerous tackles, like stuff like that. But I don't have a problem, and this is where I need to, again, remind myself that I should be doing this with 
punishing people for making for doing things that you know go against the spirit of the game right. or specifically are trying to unfairly gain an advantage that isn't within the actual passage of play yeah so again you know we're, we're kicking the ball away after the ball goes out of bounds right we're taking too long to get off the field um stuff like that you know coaches who decide that they want to yell and argue well after the play is has gone you know right. those are the types of things that yeah we need to start giving cards for yeah well i mean i'm just wondering how in a situation uh when you're out there how do you keep from how, how difficult is it to keep control and not lose control of how you are when it comes to your own philosophy, if a game is going sideways or something like that, how do you how do you try to manage yourself, and how difficult is that at times hmm. to try to make sure that you are that you stay true to your own refing personality, understanding the laws of the game, and administering it the way that it should be? How difficult is it to keep control sometimes if something if a game in front of you is going sideways or goes sideways suddenly? Well, again, we're three people trying to manage. 22 plus coaches plus spectators. So, you know, unfortunately we only have so much control, um, especially over individuals, but something that I try to make sure I remind myself, um, is to take a breath, calm down. Um, because one, you know, for us, we're running around and not everyone's in the greatest shape. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, especially if it's our fourth game of the day and we're tired. Yes. So uh, taking a step, you know, taking a chance when the ball goes out of play to take a few calming breaths um, to help you be a little bit more centered so that you can be the cool head on the field. Because, you know, that's ultimately what we're supposed to be doing out there is being the cooler head um, surrounded by a bunch of people who have zero interest in being calm. Right. How many miles a day do you put in? Have you ever done that on a Fitbit? Have you looked? Um, I did. I so I I had a, a smartwatch before, and I had some data. I need to go back and look at it. Um, it it, it could be one point eight miles a game. Wow. If I was in the center, Man. um, and usually about point nine as a linesman. Um, so you know, depending on how long I was going, it was. You know, we're talking about easily hitting a 5K mm. each day, you know, sometimes more. <laughs> um, yeah. That, yeah, that, that's just, mm -mm, that's too much for me. Uh, so what do we need to keep an eye on this week before the announcement after the show is over on Friday for Camp Cupcake? Uh, well, so obviously there's that. Um, we'll be recording um, for Soccer for Us a nice little resolutions, goals, and predictions for U.S. soccer, not just men's, not just women's, but all of them. Um, we'll re be recording that this week with um, Caleb and, and Thomas to, you know, set the tone for 2024. Um, as I said last week, you know, 2023 wasn't fantastic for U.S. soccer in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, I think the crew on Soccer for Us, we want to hold U.S. soccer to a higher standard because uh, we should be able to do that. And hopefully 2024 brings that. And we'll be keeping an eye on that as we go. Thanks for thanks for, uh, you know, letting us know that your real life stuff was. Uh, yeah. Was, was clear. Was nice. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I can drop in. My meeting died. All right, my friend. Uh, once again, thanks for a great 2023 with you and the Soccer Free US POD crew. And uh, looking forward to 2024 as we start it all over again. Thanks again, my friend. Likewise, John, and Happy New Year, everyone. Hope everyone's New Year's resolutions are going super awesome. I hope everyone's getting into the gym today if they made that, or you know, not if that was your resolution, depending on you know how you feel. That is my resolution. Be good, my friend. We'll see you soon. Not to get into the gym. I like that for you, John. Yes, John. not to get in the gym. <laughs> yes, Bye, y'all. All right, that's Bart, and so hot tag. <laughs>